Uh, in terms the preservative. Corneal cross-linking shall we do? And yes, then after sir. That, we'll go ahead with the cross-linking. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. So he will be talking about the recent updates in corneal cross-linking. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mamta. I'll be talking about uh, what are the recent updates that have come up in corneal cross-linking. We know that corneal cross-linking is an established modality uh, these days for uh, uh, stabilizing the cone in keratoconus. And uh, it is usually done in progressive keratoconus. So these are some of the evidences of uh, progressive keratoconus. Uh, and uh, since there are many factors uh, involved in it, so there was a global consensus that was uh, done on uh, uh, the criteria that should be included for, uh, for this thing, for uh, progressiveness of keratoconus. And that is progressive steepening of anterior corneal surface, posterior corneal surface and progressive thinning. And if it is, uh, if there is a progressive keratoconus in that case, uh, corneal cross-linking is the standard modality which is an established modality these days for stabilizing the cone uh, in keratoconus. So, in a standard technique, the Dresden protocol, what you do, you debride the central 7 millimeter of epithelium, then you put riboflavin every 2 minutes for 30 minutes. And then uh, after that you focus the uh, UV rays for 30 minutes and you keep putting riboflavin again for 30 minutes. So it's a one hour uh, duration uh, treatment modality and uh, it is quite effective. There are many studies, various studies now uh, have shown the effect of corneal cross-linking and it is shown by the presence of a demarcation line. And as you can see here, demarcation line is seen at the almost two-third of the thickness of the cornea. And that's why it is said that cross-linking works mostly in anterior two-third of the cornea. And, uh, uh, but, and that is why in post-classic ectasia, it is not a uh, very great modality because since it works in anterior two-third of cornea, and uh, almost 150, uh, around 140, 150 microns of the anterior uh, cornea is uh, made by flap of the LASIK. And it is known that flap does not contribute to the strength of the cornea. And that is why it is said that post LASIK ectasia may not be the uh, best cases. The primary keratoconus has better, uh, you know, uh, the effect of cross-linking is better in primary keratoconus than in post LASIK ectasia. Then uh, various uh, procedures have been combined with it, which is called CXL plus, like uh, you can use PRK, ICRS, uh, like ring segments and toric ICL for this. Now, uh, when you do uh, PRK in uh, and cross-linking in keratoconus, the idea is to uh, not to correct the refractive error, but to just to smoothen the surface, to reduce the irregularity so that uh, uh, the patient can be fitted contact lens, the contact lens fit can be good and the patient can be rehabilitated. Again, as far as intracorneal ring segment is concerned, uh, the idea is to reduce the astigmatism and uh, then do cross-linking. So that is why many times these days we put asymmetric segments because in most of the keratoconus cases the uh, astigmatism is high so asymmetric segments are more useful than symmetric segments because symmetric segments reduce the spherical power, asymmetric segments reduce the cylindrical power and sometimes we use a single segment as well. So the, first of all we open up the initial track after creating my femtosecond laser. You can do it with a mechanical separator as well and then you put this uh, PMMA ring into one pocket and then you put another ring in another pocket and then uh, this radial incision is closed with a suture and uh, once you have done that, then you debride the epithelium within the uh, ring segments and then do cross-linking uh, of the cornea. So the idea is to uh, remodel the corneal shape and then stiffen it by cross-linking. And uh, studies have shown uh, reasonably good results uh, in these cases with the ring segments and cross-linking. So it is now an established modality. CXL is an established modality in keratoconus. But there are certain issues and for which we keep doing various researches, various studies. And uh, one of the issues is pain. Because you debride the epithelium, nerve endings are exposed. Uh, so the patient has pain. The second issue is a long duration. Patient's cooperation for one hour is needed. And the third issue was uh, if the cornea is thin, like uh, if the cornea is thinner than 400 microns, the UV rays can have detrimental effect on the corneal endothelium. And based on that, various uh, innovations have been tried. 
like uh, 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 to reduce pain the epithelium uh, without debriding epithelium trans epithelial cxl have been done has been done but it has not been found to be as effective as conventional cross linking then people tried various ways they, these are say various studies which have shown that ep off has a better uh, impact then there are various ways of doing people have done criss crossing of epithelial uh, uh, removal so that some area will have uh, it will be denuded of epithelium and some area will have epithelium but then it doesn't work because the area wherein uh, the epithelium is intact the the uh, this um, the demarcation line is not uh, clearly visible so this means that probably the effect is not there in that area so the punch line is that uh, currently in order to have good efficacy of cross linking we have to debride the epithelium then uh, regarding duration uh, many uh, other protocols have come up in accelerated cross linking that is based on bunsen roscoe law of reciprocity so instead of 3 milliwatt per centimeter square for 30 minutes various other protocols are there 9 milliwatt per centimeter square 18 milliwatt per centimeter square for 5 minutes 30 milliwatt per centimeter square for 30 minutes and we were very excited initially by doing 30 milliwatt per centimeter for 3 minutes but now the studies have shown that uh, the effect may not be as good with 30 milliwatt per centimeter for, uh, per centimeter square for 30 minutes. The effect of 9 milliwatt per centimeter square for 10 minutes is uh, mostly comparable with the conventional cross-linking, and that is why, uh, uh, as far as accelerated cross-linking is concerned, uh, this protocol is followed. Then in thin corneas, uh, people have tried hypoosmolar riboflavin so as to swell the cornea. The effect is there, but the effect is not that much because at one, uh, in one, uh, on one hand you are separating the collagen lamellae by uh, uh, hydrating the stroma and on the other hand by cross-linking you are trying to make it compact. So the effect is not that great, but yes, it has some impact in thin corneas. People have tried uh, various other things like bandage contact lens, uh, but bandage contact lens has a problem again uh, you do cross-linking, it works in anterior two-third of cornea. So what happens, part of it is discarded because bandage contact lens is removed. It is, uh, it is uh, occupied by bandage contact lens. Another thing is that the tear film behind the bandage contact lens allows less penetration of, corneal, uh, of uh, UV rays and that's why the effect is not that great. Again, people have used stromal lent uh, smile stromal lenticules, but it has not been uh, that effect. So we tried in RP center, we did a... Uh, we have done two studies actually by uh, we created an intrastomal pocket and then introduced uh, uh, with a femtosecond laser and then introduced uh, uh, a stromal lamellae 200 microns created by a microkeratome with uh, uh, donor tissue so here after doing dissection you you inject riboflavin into the pocket so the the penetration of riboflavin on both sides of the stroma is quite fast and then after that you uh, put a donor, this is the stromal lenticule that has been fashioned by a microkeratome and that is introduced into the, uh, inside the corneal stroma. So uh, once you have done it, uh, then you do cross-linking and uh, uh, that is how it is done. So day one the stromal lamellae swells up, I'll just finish in one minute. And uh, in day one it swells up, uh, but then later on it re the thickness reduces and then you have a reasonably good effect. You can see here that the cornea is quite clear. The only thing is that it has two interfaces, so you have to give topical steroid for long because initial cases when we did not give topical steroid for long, uh, there was uh, interface haze that was seen. So that is what uh, this is, uh, uh, you can see here the nice topographic map after putting this lenticule. Actually, I did not go into details of lenticule. We create a negative meniscus lenticule by ablating the central part of the cornea. So it does have a sort of an intact kind of effect as well because the peripheral part is thick and the central is uh, thinner. And then another option that has come up now these days is customized cross-linking, the idea of uh, putting more power in the area where there is, uh, which is thinner and weaker and lesser power in the peripheral area. Studies are on, but uh, uh, we are yet to be absolutely sure about its efficacy. Again, uh, studies have shown that oxygen concentration reduces in the stroma when you do uh, use, uh, expose the cornea to UV rays. So people have 
done animal study uh, using uh, uh, external source of uh, oxygen by uh, putting oxygen around the around the cornea uh, the animal studies had shown some some good effect by theocellular group but uh, we did a human study and uh, we found out i'll just skip this video which uh, we have created this indigenous goggles this goggle costs about 3000 euros and this we created ourselves and that costs 400 rupees actually with this goggles actually you can you can uh, also uh, measure the oxygen saturation which we have tried uh, this is how we put oxygen from here we measure the oxygen saturation from here this is the open part uh, through which the uv rays are focused and on the anesthesia machine you can measure the oxygen saturation also we maintained it at a level of 84% average and that is how we did but having said that the results are not as gratifying as we had thought of although uh, there are some uh, uh, there is some effect definitely slightly better effect but uh, not that gratifying and we are working on it more uh, for uh, and uh, longer follow up is needed to see so there are some queries raised by this that whether oxygen saturation is directly related to the efficacy of cross linking another paper has just now come with adaptive fluence by farhad afizi group it is again a questionable kind of a thing because here even in a cornea as thin as 214 microns he has done cross linking has shown good effect done cross linking conventional method just for 2 minutes there is a big question many queries raised for this paper whether it is as effective or not so maybe with time we will be able to know more so i won't go into details and would like to conclude that cross linking is an established modality and various innovations have been done these days in order to improve the efficacy as well as acceptability of cross linking so thank you very much for your patient listening any comment or thank query so i'll be happy to talk. answer I and if you allow i'll yes sir yeah. yes sir i will quickly can i ask a quick question yeah yeah sir? please please so considering we have so many machines so many i mean brands of machine in the market without considering the financial aspect is there any particular one which you prefer or you got good results with that uh, uh we are doing with uh, this uh, peshke one so uh, that is what I, i don't have a comparative study but uh, this is one which has a good effect so that's what we use so peshke peshke yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so moving on with the next talk by dr uh, rajesh sinha sir and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. please sir please. Uh, sir in uh, below 400 as you said there are lot of patients who come with below 400 micron yeah. thickness yeah. so lenticular assisted cxl or donor cornea related cxl in matlab uh, any experience on yeah that's that's what i showed actually I think I yeah <laughs> I yeah i had shown that uh, you know uh, if the thickness is less instead of putting the lenticule over it or instead of putting the cross uh, bandage contact lens over it if there is no scarring in such a case uh, we have used uh, stromal lenticule by creating a donor uh, from a donor tissue we created the stromal lenticule of 200 microns and then it was implanted now initially when we used we used a 7 mm lenticule so the effect was not that great in some of the cases where in the cone was Uh, of the larger size and then the peripheral thick part was coming over the cone what we did we ablated the central part so we made a negative meniscus lenticule so as to have a, a, a ring segment like effect as well and then we do cross linking it will have tectonic support it increases thickness it stiffens the cornea by cross linking you put riboflavin in the in the pocket so there's diffusion of riboflavin also very well so the re result was good and but later on we increased the diameter of the lenticule to 8.5 and now we have completed that study and we found that the effect of 8.5 lenticule is much better than the 7 mm lenticule and the uh, pre and post op actually because of paucity of time i have not i could not show all the results but the pre and post op picture if you see then the irregularity in the surface that is seen uh, on pentacam before was uh, in many of the cases it was neutralized you will see an absolutely nice bow tie pattern one picture i had shown of one uh, post op uh, patient very nice uh, regular bow tie pattern after putting the this 8.5 mm lenticule and uh, a negative meniscus lenticule with cross linking sir i have one more question sir yeah. if you have a pediatric patient of say 9 10 10 or 11 years and he has a cct of 350 so obviously we cannot go for go for ap off considering we would be reducing it further so what the options we have even with ap on it would be lesser than 
yeah yeah yes. so in such case yes we can try that's what i'm trying to uh, standardize this procedure by uh, just now uh, one, uh, i have done two theses with two lenticular size and now i am doing a third icmr uh, project on this uh, uh, these uh, cases only so i'll have a longer follow up and we'll be able to standardize the procedure but otherwise once we have been able to standardize the procedure then we can do it in children we are having 350 microns because it will not only increase the thickness of the cornea it will, make it it will stiffen the cornea and then uh, a good contact lens uh, 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 yeah, rehabilitation is possible the child can be but right now what we have with that hypoosmolar is not a good option as yeah hypoosmolar is not such a great option in children again it is uh, many times you have some vkc etc that also needs to be controlled so hypoosmolar has a limited effect even primary keratoconus in uh, uh, you know adults in uh, not in children in children again the results may not be that great so maybe i haven't done in children the intrastomal lenticule but maybe with time we will be in a position to uh, you know get with some uh, you know maybe it's a good idea we can do a children study as well uh, doing this intrastomal lenticule the only issue is that uh, we need cooperation it has to be done under uh, general anesthesia for creating the pocket also we need a co reasonable cooperation from the child so that is uh, something uh, a hindrance yeah so pockets were created with femtosecond laser with femtosecond laser initially we did it with the visumax because we can create a 7.8 mm maximum pocket of 7.8 mm with visumax but then uh, uh, since we had to implant uh, bigger size so we went to fs200 we used fs200 to create a 9 mm pocket and we implanted an 8.5 mm lenticule so the second procedure that we have done now just completed thesis that is showing better results than the first one so docking in keratoconus was any issue docking in the keratoconus no actually uh, the minimum thickness that we have used is up to 330 microns docking is not at all an issue only thing is that uh, there shouldn't be any scarring we should avoid in do and the second thing is that uh, any scarring in the donor stroma also should be avoided because mostly we use a b grade tissue a non optical grade tissue so in one case i there was thin stromal scar i hoped that it will clear up but it became more condensed even if steroid so a couple of uh, adverse events are there like one case had infection also i had to remove the lenticule a couple of adverse events are there but uh, the most of the cases have shown good results only thing is long term steroid is needed otherwise there is interface haze so see uh, dalk is a different procedure this is a different procedure so uh, indication for dalk will be different like uh, i can do a dalk in a case who has a 330 or 340 microns thickness with a superficial scarring any case with a superficial scar i won't put a lenticule okay uh, so i will rather go for a dalk and then rehabilitate the patient subsequently uh, with contact lens or whatever after putting after removing sutures so dalk can be done in cases wherein you have uh, you know reducing thickness 330 250 lower lower cut off see uh, manual dissection you can do even up to 240 250 but uh, if you are doing a big bubble one then uh, it's better to uh, use it if you have a corneal thickness of more than 300 then uh, it's better otherwise uh, anything below 280 will be dangerous if we don't have any other question from the can we go to the next presentation sir? okay so the next dr. thing that dr ashish can you please come to the chair the next uh, topic that i'll be presenting is the role of immunomodulator in post lasik uh, dry eye so post surgical dry eye is something which is a an entity which is uh, has become uh, known now and it's an important issue it can be seen after lasik it can be seen after cataract surgery or any other surgery and particularly somebody who is uh, at risk of developing dry eye he, he will have this uh, uh, component of post surgical dry eye we know that in lasik we create a flap so we cut the nerves so there is reduced corneal sensation and that's why there is reduced uh, tear formation 
and this is the neuronal loop and uh, if you cut make a flap this uh, signal to the brain is does not go it goes lesser and that's how you have less tear secretion it is more depressed in long term contact lens wearers and uh, preoperative dry eyes then uh, uh, as far as corneal reinnervation is concerned the reinnervation of cornea occurs com near complete reinnervation occurs only after 4 to 5 years but in 6 months to 1 year time the corneal reinnervation is enough so that the patient does not have symptoms related to dry eye even after cataract surgery patients do have dry eye because you create a uh, uh, a, a corneal incision although it's of smaller size but still you cut the nerves then these patients are also older they have may women gland dysfunction some of these patients are females with um, menopausal uh, perimenopausal age group and uh, some may be having coexisting glaucoma with anti glaucoma drugs then uh, many times you want to reduce astigmatism you make additional cuts so all these things they can reduce the uh, nerves and that can cause dryness even in glaucoma surgery use of antimitotic antimitotic agent can cause loss of limbal stem cells it can cause ocular surface disorder even after retinal surgery there can be uh, a risk of uh, uh, all these dry eye and it has been seen that people uh, patients wherein silicon oil was used the uh, evidence of dry eye was more so coming to the management of dry eye if any patient has a dry eye or you have done a lasik you would like to put the patient on artificial tear drop which is preservative free and if the patient has a subtle evidence of inflammation some sign of inflammation some uh, or pre existing dry eye in such cases you would like to give anti inflammatory drugs like topical steroid or topical cyclosporine now cyclosporine is a is an fda approved uh, therapy and uh, we have been using cyclosporine in dry eye it's an established modality there's no doubt about it and uh, there are various studies which have shown that in post lasik uh, if you use cyclosporine the quality and quantity of vision is better the the uh, recovery of vision is again faster the quality of vision improves with use of uh, cyclosporine and that's what uh, has been shown in most of the studies so the again uh, uh, cyclosporine is a good drug for post lasik dry eye that's a known thing or any patient who has a pre existing dry eye so what are the problems now some of the patients uh, uh, on whom you will give cyclosporine they complain of stinging and irritation and all that that is basically because most of the formulations are oil based and they have uh, preservatives as well now uh, if you have a i'm sorry i'm sorry if you have uh, uh, something some preparation which is uh, uh, aqueous based the patient will have less irritation and if the patient and if the preparation does not have a preservative the patient will have less symptoms and that is what has come up uh, no financial interest but uh, there is a preservative free uh, cyclosporine has come up which is cyclosis pf and which has a ph value close to 7 so the patients uh, have also used in uh, some of the patients and uh, the irritation and the stinging is much lesser the reason is this that as i told you that the ph is 6.9 and that is very close to 7 which will give comfort to the patient then uh, this preparation also has a novelia uh, multi dose eye dropper now multi dose uh, 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 drugs have the risk of contamination and that is why preservatives are used but if this system novelia system has unique advantage that uh, the drops which which has fallen they fell and anything which has come out will not go back so that is the advantage of novelia system so the risk of contamination is less so cyclosporine uh, has been shown to improve uh, provide qualitative and quantitative improvement in tear film it increases goblet cell density and thereby it is not a palliative drug it's a disease modifying drug and it is given twice daily uh, uh, in cases so the question is that uh, cyclosporine does require a long uh, duration of treatment not uh, just by uh, month or two you will not get a result oh, in two months time you will start getting some result and it needs a long term therapy at least for 6 months at least for 1 year 2 years even longer in some patients 
So, the point is that whether it, it is required in all the cases, so I would say no, because many of the cases they can be managed even without cyclosporine. But there are many sub, uh, huge subset of patients who will, sh if you examine carefully, they will have subtle signs of inflammation. Or those patients who had some uh, predisposition of dry eye, or some patients who are more symptomatic. In all these patients, use of cyclosporin, topical cyclosporin is very effective. And uh, if uh, uh, the cyclosporin is preservative free, and if the pH is close to 7, then uh, definitely the patient does not have a stinging or burning cessation as well. So that's the advantage of this drug. So thank you very much uh, for your patient listening and any uh, point you would like to add or suggest. Do we have any comment here, sir? No, very nice presentation. Just wanted to know what is your, for the larger audience, what is the uh, preferred choice of lubricant for post-LASIK patients? Oh, that's the most difficult question on earth, actually. And, uh, it, uh, but uh, in a routine case, you can go for any drug, anything, anything of your choice. Like uh, you can use CMC, you can use polyethylene glycol, you can use HA, anything you want. Whichever, uh, and there's one susceptibility also uh, of every patient for one each polymer so that is also an issue so you have to see that whether the patient is comfortable or not if the patient is not comfortable you can change but if somebody who is having a pre-existing dry eye if somebody who is uh, who requires some volume then in that case ha can be useful somebody uh, who is not very comfortable with uh, uh, you know these uh, cmcs you can move to HA or you can use to polyethylene glycol. So, to tell you frankly, uh, nobody can say that this polymer is the best polymer. It is best provided your patient is comfortable, provided you are comfortable with the use of that drug. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, absolutely nothing. We have used 2% cyclosporine uh, for long and uh, in those cases also systemic absorption was much less. The concentration was less than 159 uh, nanogram per ml of blood and anything beyond that can have some adverse event but uh, even with 2% the, the blood concentration is absolutely safe. So this is 0 0.05 or 0.1% whatever you are using, it is absolutely safe. Twice a, see, normally we give twice a day. Uh, for therapeutic purposes, four times a day has also been used, 0.1 percent, four times a day. But uh, normally we use uh, 0 0.05 percent twice a day. Even we are using uh, cyclosporine in the allergic patients also, in the children also. Yes. For a longer period of time and without any adverse effect. In, yeah, in allergic patient, I would prefer going uh, with 0.1 percent at slightly more uh, uh, higher concentration. For dry eye, 0 0.05 is good for any surface related, but for allergic patient, 0.1 percent is good. Yeah. If we don't have any other question for Dr. Rajesh Sinha, sir, sir has to go for another session. So thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for thank the wonderful you. talk. Yeah. Next, we have Dr. Pranitya Sahai, and she will be talking ab about management of perforated corneal ulcers. Uh, Good afternoon everyone, I am Dr. Pranita Sahai and I will be discussing about the topic of perforated corneal ulcer. So perforated corneal ulcer is an ocular emergency that needs, okay. So perforated corneal ulcer is an ocular emergency that needs to be dealt with urgently uh, with surgical management for, optical out, uh, for optimal outcomes. The etiology in the most common cause being infective keratitis and others being neurotrophic ulcers and PUK are the common causes that can lead to per corneal perforations. Now the management is targeted based on the size and location of the ulcer. The treatment has to be modified. 
For small ulcers, a corneal gluing can be done for intermediate. A patch graft is needed, while for large ulcers, therapeutic keratoplasty is often needed. Now, during COVID pandemic, we faced a lot of challenges, especially in management of patients of perforated corneal ulcers, because firstly, they had a delayed presentation, the OT protocols were in place, there was lack of donor cornea tissues, and difficulty in the frequent follow-up of patients, wherein different modalities were more commonly tried at that time compared to keratoplasty in these patients' management. So I'll do a case-based presentation here. The this is the first patient who's an 18-year-old female who came to me during the first uh, COVID pandemic, uh, first lockdown. She had recurrent episodes of redness and watering, had a course of ATT taken for pulmonary tuberculosis one year back, and now she had a conjunctival ulcer. She was a diagnosed case of flectanular keratoconjunctivitis. The look of it looked infectious, but uh, scraping of the conjunctival ulcer was negative, hence we considered that it, it was a large conjunctival flect started her on steroids she showed good response the conjunctival also start to heal but she developed a puk by day three and again she was lost to follow up and day 12 she developed a peripheral corneal perforation with uveal tissue prolapse despite of topical steroid therapy now we had a patient with a size of perforation being 3 into 2.5 location was peripheral there was uveal tissue prolapse vision was 6 9 now the options were either go for corneal gluing or patch graft now, while gluing could be easily done, it was easily available, cost uh, effective, but the stability of glue in peripheral perforation is always a doubt because it does not use good adhere well to the scleral, uh, scleral tissue. Also, the stability in a perforation which is nearly 3 mm is also questionable. So corneal patch graft could have been a better option, but lack of tissue availability, we planned the patient for a tenon patch graft. This is a so short surgical video where we can see uh, so we can see that the patient has been taken under peribulbar block. The size of the perforation was measured. A 20% oversize was marked on the supratemporal conjunctival area and a, a subconjunctival xyloedry was injected. A linear peritomy was done and subconjunctival tissue dissection was carefully done following which the tenon tissue was harvested. Following this, the site of harvest was closed by mechanical apposition. There were no sutures applied, no glue. And in the post-op period, we found that it, it did close well with just the manual apposition. After this, a side port entry was made and pilocarpin and air was injected. However, the uveal tissue, since it was the perforation must have been there for a couple of days, it did not reposit and hence a Sinsky hook was used to gently reposit it back without damaging either the iris or the lens as the patient was faking and had a clear lens. A localized cushion of OVD was given to avoid adhesion of the iris to the patch craft tenon patch that would be put. A localized peritomy was also done and conjunctival tissue was resected out so as to avoid any surrounding inflammation as the conjunctival ulcer was still there. Also, uh, the bleeders were cauterized. A 360 degree tunnel was made at the site where the, uh, we had uh, removed the tissue at the site of the defect, following which the tenon patch was sutured with 10 -0. Filament, monofilament suture, interrupted sutures were put. Also, an augmentation with cyanoacrylate glue was done at the edges as uh, leak with tenon patch graft is something that we commonly see in the post-op period that leads to shallow AC wound leaks. To avoid that complication, we put cyanoacrylate at the edges. These are the post-operative pictures. Three months, the patient had a well-integrated graft. Although there was a focal adhesion of the iris there, but there was no uveitis, no inflammation. Vision was 6'9", improving to 6'6". Now, this is another case here. This was a 14-year-old male who had multiple surgeries, VR surgery, squint surgery, re-VR, SOR, and finally ended up in a neurotrophic ulcer. Now, the patient was medically managed initially. However, he ended up with a small central perforation. Uh, now, the site of the perforation was central. Perf size was less than one millimeter. Hence, we went for a corneal gluing. This is a video that we show, wherein we show that even a cyanoacrylate glue application can be done on the slit lamp in an OPD without waiting for an OT availability, especially in cases where your anterior chamber is formed. 
after topical anesthesia application, we uh, gently applied the speculum to avoid a collapse of the anterior chamber. The application of the speculum has to be extremely gentle. The surface was dried. The surrounding epithelium was tried to be debrided with the help of this merosil sponge. And the site of perforation, we gently apply with a 20, 30 gauge needle, we apply a small drop of glue and then wait for 10 to 20 seconds for it to dry. We see that the first drop is applied and since it was looking a little thin, I reapplied another drop and at this time we have to be careful that we don't want a mound formation because we need to apply a BCL at the end of the process. If there's a mound formation, the BCL is not going to stay and then the process is of no use. And after this dries, the BCL is applied and the speculum can be removed. Now this is a third case, again a patient, a 45 year old male, uncontrolled diabetic, was never aware of his blood sugar status. He came with pain, redness, discharge and diminution of vision for 10 days in the right eye. He had a perforated corneal ulcer, vision of 6-9 because the perforation was peripheral, infiltrates peripheral, central cornea clear. Now this is a dicey situation, you know whatever you are trying to going to do with the management of this patient, vision is going to fall and that is what you need to explain to the patient preoperatively. So now here the location is peripheral size perforation 2.5 millimeter, uveal tissue prolapse and surrounding infiltrate. Now in the first case we saw that the peripheral perforation a tenon patch could be done but here in the presence of peripheral infiltrates a tenon patch could not be done. Hence we went for a corneal patch graft in this patient and as you can see at one month the graft also cleared up, there were no infiltrates, uveal tissue could be, the uveal tissue although had to be excised so the pupil was not circular but the patient had an uncorrected visual equity of 618 even with this procedure that was done. Now this is the fourth patient, this is a five month old female who has a keratomalacia sequelae due to biliary atresia that was the cause for vitamin A deficiency. She had a corneal perforation with melting and a flat interior chamber. Hence, considering the large size and the peripheral location and associated melting, a tectonic PK was planned for this patient. So in, this, in these patients what we need to do is remove the host corneal button and ensure that you have removed all the melted cornea. Since the horizontal diameter of the melt was nearly around 8 millimeter, we had to excise around 8.5 8 millimeter. And after removing the host cornea, a repeat measurement is always essential in these patients before we punch the donor cut because in flat anterior chambers and perforations, your initial measurements may be fallacious. If this was again a patient operated during COVID times where tissue wall availability was an issue, hence a glycerin preserved cornea had to be used. So the poor quality cornea, that is not what you really want to use in your patients, but in dire situation, maintaining the anterior segment integrity is probably the first priority and hence we went on with using this tissue and had a well-formed anterior chamber and the patient was registered for optical keratoplasty later on. So with this presentation, uh, what I wanted to say is that every case of perforated corneal ulcer is different and a case-based approach is necessary for the best outcomes. There are various treatment options available. The location and size of perforation and the state of surrounding cornea ultimately determines the surgical procedure that you have to opt for your patient. Thank very, you. Very, very nice presentation, Pranita. Uh, I, I have not tried uh, tenon patch graft, but just wanted to ask whether yeah. in infected perforated ulcers, what do you try? Uh, so infected perforated ulcer, if first of all, uh, in presence of infection, suturing the tenon graft itself is a difficult thing. People have tried it in the presence of infection where they have sutured it beyond the site of infiltrate and have shown good results. Uh, but personally, even I haven't done it in an infected patient, so I really cannot comment upon that. Yeah. Hmm. Beyond. beyond. Yes. But one thing I wanted to ask is that uh, whatever you did with the, you reposited the iris, is it wise to be in all cases because you tried to reposit the iris? No, no, sir. I excised the iris. The iris was excised. It, I, I was creating a tunnel all around in the cornea. Oh, in, in the first case, yes, because there was no infection in that patient and it was a one day old perforation that the patient was saying and it looked healthy intra-op, that is why I reposited. I yes. mean, if the iris is good uh, looking, I mean, yeah. no, it healthy. Will be no necrosis, we can reposit in some of the cases. Yeah. yeah, we placed the BCL at the end of the procedure, that was not shown in the video. Yeah.
And what was and the, the tenon patch also in the end the BCL was put. Yes. How was the management after that uh, vitamin A deficiency patient? How was how yes? Was so the, no. So the graft ultimately did fail. It uh, it became an opaque graft. The patient was in pediatric surgery for multiple interventions. Finally, did not turn up for the optical keratoplasty. I saw the patient for six months, around six to eight months. Another, at least I didn't go into thysis and did not develop glaucoma. The pressures were normal. But the graft. Yeah. Was Graft, white, but it, it was, was it taken up well. Yeah, there was no melt, there was no infection. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next time, Dr. Vanshika. Dr. Vanshika here? No. Uh, Dr. Rajesh has done. Dr. John Shakar. Okay, uh, can I invite Dr. Nilesh? To, yeah, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So I think uh, very nice presentations are going on. We were enriched by the knowledge of C3R. Now, how to deal with perforations and all. So while a corneal surgeon is doing these things in his uh, OPD and in his, his clinical practice, now what are the outcomes that matters? So uh, I'm here to just brief you out the clinical outcome of the first 100 consecutive therapeutic penetrating keratoplasties which we had done at our center. Uh, these are all brief facts which uh, need not be mentioned uh, and repeated because it's an important cause of blindness. Uh, NPCB estimates currently say that around 1,20,000 blind persons are residing in India and in addition every time 25 to 30,000 patients are adding up. And the core study has defined infectious keratitis to be an important cause of corneal blindness and morbidity in Indian population. And uh, to add on, one of the landmark studies from South India has recognized corneal ulcer as a silent epidemic of Southeast Asian region. And extrapolation of Indian estimates of the incidence of corneal ulcer approximately is 1.5 to 2 million corneal ulcers annually in our country. So this is the magnitude of the thing which we are discussing. And what we do is that the progressive corneal ulcers, which are not responding to medications, their definitive treatment is in the form of penetrating keratoplasty only. Either the, the stopgap arrangements are teen patch graft or whatever we do when we don't have the, uh, when we have a paucity of tissues. Now the post-operative outcome of these type of cases have considered variety of factors among which infection eradication is one of the most important. Second is visual acuity, uh, whether there was a history of an associated trauma in those cases whether there was any use of traditional medications or whether there was a scleral involvement when the patient reached you or whether there was any coexisting disease. So, so these all factors were uh, the, uh, responsible, I mean, taken into consideration for, the, for evaluating the post-operative outcomes in various studies. So keeping all this in mind, we analyzed the clinical outcome of 100 cases. A retrospective analysis was done at RIO IGMS at Patna. And TPK for non-healing keratitis with or without perforation with a minimum year of one year of follow-up was done. We excluded patients with vitreous exudates on first, on arrival to us. So uh, records of patients between October 2014 to 17 were thoroughly analyzed and primary treatment of these patients were in accordance with the severity of the presentation and primary microbial evaluation was performed at the time of present presentation and was repeated after a week in cases of non-responding ulcers. Initial antimicrobial treatment was modified as per the culture sensitivity report and the clinical response to the treatment as is done by any clinician. Posterior segment evaluation was done with the ultrasound B scan to rule out any involvement of the vitreous. Now, keratoplasty was performed after the initial management failed in non-responding progressive ulcers, ulcers with desmotocele and pre patients presenting with a perforated corneal ulcers. 
Now the donor cornea utilized in the surgery was total. All of them we utilized the therapeutic grade tissues and the average size of the graft used was around 9 millimeters. In our study, what we found is that primary lens removal was done in cases where anterior capsule of the lens was already compromised at the time of surgery. And the donor button was larger than graft size by 0.5 millimeters, it was a standard protocol and was secured with 10-0 monofilament nylon sutures. Post-op medication which was used was antimicrobials and the supportive treatment as cycloplegics intraocular lowering agents as and when required along with the lubricating drops. We considered post-operative glaucoma, post-TPK glauco uh, glaucoma in our cases where the IOP was greater than 21 mm uh, millimeters of mercury on NCT or digitally raised IOP where the measurement was absolutely not possible. Now what we did is the success of surgery was measured in terms of infection eradication and maintenance of the globe integrity. Uh, I will emphasize why we put this way. Other factors considered were the need of repeat surgery, an IOP control and the presence of the graft clarity. Now these uh, patients were followed up for one year. So on presentation, all the ulcers were graded as per the uh, uh, classification proposed. 15 cases presented with corneal perforation larger than 3 mm in size. 22 cases had desmetocele at the time of presentation and scleral involvement was found in 6 of the cases. The nature of the microbial pathogen could be ascertained only in 60 patients and the rest 40 the microbial report was inconclusive. So the, coming to the distribution of the organisms, 65% were of fungal origin and rest 20% were bacterial and 15 had mixed infections and most common uh, fungus was Aspergill is found in our cases. <laughs> Lensectomy during uh, TPK. 10 cases were found to have lens involvement with the primary infection and removal of lens uh, matter was done and uh, sparing the posterior capsule in 10 of the cases. And 7 cases had inadvertent removal of the lens bag complex uh, and there we did a thorough anterior vitrectomy, cleaned and then put up the graft. Now, talking of the graft clarity, graft clarity allowing the view of the anterior chamber could only be maintained in 26 cases, 15 of which 15 were of bacterial keratitis preoperatively seen on microbiology, 5 had fungal pathology and in the rest 6 cases were those cases where the microbial uh, findings were inconclusive. Now, again coming to the distribution of uh, Organisms in cases of graft infection. Now, repeat graft infection was noticed in 23 cases. In this also, fungal was the most common, 39%, accounting 39%, and aspergillus was found to be the commonest. And thereafter, bacterial, and there were few patients, 12 of them, where we didn't have a conclusive microbiology report earlier on presentation. Now, Talking about the graft infection, the earliest onset of infiltrate was seen on day 2 of the surgery where we found graft infections. Now none of the cases, I'll just, I'll just take 2 minutes more, okay, oh yeah. okay, I'll just take a couple of, ah. so uh, what we were talking is graft clarity where it was a uh, graft infection, it was seen earliest on second day of uh, the surgery and none of the cases got uh, any kind of a graft infection after three weeks of surgery. And they were treated uh, depending upon the uh, microorganisms isolated. Now in cases where primary pathogen was not known, in cases of inconclusive microbiology reports, uh, topical and systemic antibiotics were the main uh, arm of the treatment. Now, by all these things, anatomical restoration could be maintained in 96% of the cases. Four cases required evisceration despite all measures done. Now, com coming to the stats is that the repeat TPK was 7 out of 23. Now, in glaucoma, 10 out of the 47 cases 
uh, of secondary glaucoma were seen in our total 100 patients. And in the four eviscerated patients, three of them had prior scleral involvement preoperatively. So, in this what we found is that the graft infection rate in our study was around 23%. Success rate, the, as we considered the success rate as a restoration of the globe, so in bacterial cases we found maximum followed by the fungal one. Globe integrity was salvaged in 96% of cases and graft clarity was 26% at one year. And of those, bacterial were 57%, which was slightly lower than which was shown in other studies. Those patients having fungal pathology were around 19%, which was also slightly lower than other studies. Maybe this may be because of a shorter volume plus more dirty cases uh, do report to our centers. And a repeat penetrating keratoplasty was required in 30% of uh, graft infection cases, which is slightly higher than other studies. So the volume of the, uh, the number of cases which we have seen is limited and the uh, follow-up period was shorter. But despite that, the graft uh, uh, infection rate was quite higher than the other studies. And in uh, glaucoma, surgery was required in around 21% of post-TPK glaucomas found in these patients and evisceration required was around 4%. So, what I want to conclude is that post-operative successful outcome can be considered in terms of salvaging the tissue by infection eradication and maintaining the globe integrity. No matter at that point of time whether the visual outcome, whatever it is coming, at least if you could have salvaged it because different cases behave differently. In, those dirt, in many dirty cases where you feel that this eye is going to be absolutely gone, those cases also do uh, uh, turn up later on and then you find, okay, fine, we can register him for an optical and then things behave in a better way. So, site restoration procedures can be taken up later. One should think of infection eradication and maintaining the globe integrity if the tissue is available. This has been accepted in the Kerala Journal of Ophthalmology, waiting for publication. So, let's. Uh, this was all what we could find out. Because TPKs are, every clinician is encountering non resolving corneal ulcers. Every clinician doesn't have the access of the microbiological evaluation and uh, a tailor made approach how to move ahead depending upon the microbiology report. So, I would say majority of the centers are receiving dirty cases. All kinds of multiple medications have been tried and done and then you have to move ahead for a salvaging procedure or uh, infection eradicating, er eradicating procedure. So, we should think in this terms that yes, you should try to save maximum. Dr. Shah is here, he has been doing Yes, thank you for a wonderful talk. Actually, this problem is there in our part of India because mm -hmm. the Western literature says that you have a very good response to the encomycin. In our experience and the recent report from the uh, LBPI also says that 36% is gram negative, which is not responding to any mm -hmm. other medicine as, as except cholestine, cholestine or piperacillin. So this is a new drug which you, you must have in your armamentarium to use in all the patients. Uh, do, do not go for septadesine and vancomycin alone. Yeah. Number one. Two. Number two, in my center we have at least six to seven corneal ulcer every day. And what is the biggest thing we have learned in last five years is scraping. Scrape. Scraping is the most important thing and you do it with betadine. Five percent eye drop is available now. So you must scrape every seventh day so that the load of the bacteria is goes down and I will um, share my experience those mixed infection they 99 percent I would say in my practice they have improved now with using betadine as the first line of scraping drug and number two we use amniotic membrane in non most of the patient who have got seven eight nine drugs coming on the cornea so you stop all these medication 
and use betadine and put AMG uh, in your patient to save the non healing corneal ulcer to stop melting. And if you do not have that, yesterday only morning we did one case, we had kept for therapeutic keratoplasty, but we changed it to uh, anti chamber wash and uh, amniotic membrane transplant because when we, I opened the anti chamber, it was full of pus, pus and the pressure was very high. So in all the patients who are not doing well, you have a limbus to limbus pus Perfection, and you are yeah. not able to see the inside and the, anti the, the B scan is normal. Mm -hmm. In all those patients you must do anti chamber wash. And See, then you do a amniotic membrane grafting because if you put a therapeutic graft, it will melt or it will not work as well. So uh, uh, so, sorry, to is, sorry to interrupt, sir. We have a uh, short okay, of time. Thank you. Uh, we have many questions to you. Dr. Nilesh probably will take it later. Sure, sure, sure. We have sure. just five minutes left. Sure. Uh, may I invite Dr. Shatrakit? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilesh. Uh, next will be Dr. Satyajit Sina, who will be speaking on corneal status post phacoemulsification in uncontrolled diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Kerrier. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I'll be speaking on planning cataract surgery in uncontrolled diabetes. Now from cornea, we'll move a little bit further back to the lens. Uh, and we'll be talking about patients in uh, having undergoing cataract surgery in uncontrolled diabetes. As we know, um, wherever the per capita income is more, the incidence of diabetes is higher. Uh, there are not many studies where they have seen uh, of endothelial cell loss in uncontrolled diabetes. It's becoming a worldwide disease as we all know and we all know that in the coming years India is going to be the capital of diabetes. More so with COVID having come in, a lot of steroids were used and in the coming years, in the next five years, we are going to have a lot of patients who will be coming to your clinic with uncontrolled diabetes and um, hypermature cataracts and you have to plan them. Diabetic patients who undergo cataract and LASIK are at increased risk, risk of endothelial cell loss and have a significantly higher risk of developing post-operative epithelial complications. Although one of the major complications of diabetic eye is diabetic retinopathy, corneal diseases can not only develop in diabetic patients but are also difficult to manage. And when I say difficult to manage all the laser and everything that you have to do, you have to have a good visualization of the fundus. And if the cornea is not clear, if the endothelial function is not well and there are corneal opacities, you will have problem in doing the lasers. It is known that neuronal abnormalities directly affect the visual function in patients with diabetic retinopathy, but they may also cause corneal changes in diabetic keratopathy. The findings of the anterior segment in eyes with diabetic keratopathy are more difficult to visualize than those of the posterior segment. Although the corneas may appear disease-free in diabetic patients, marked biochemical and ultrastructural abnormalities which alter its function can be present. Though a lot of things are happening in these patients who have uncontrolled diabetes, but we will primarily focus on endothelial cell loss. Diabetic neurotropic keratopathy is a component of diabetic polyneuropathy. So many things are happening in the body and is recognized to be the cause of morbidity of the cornea in diabetic patients. In addition, corneal endothelium cell damage can cause disturbances in the man management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy because before and after surgeries because of endothelial decompensation and which ultimately leads to bullous keratopathy. The early diabetic changes of the anterior segment include endothelial changes such as Desmet's membrane folds and pigment deposits in the endothelium. However, there have been only been limited number of studies that have focused on the importance of corneal diseases in diabetic patients. Endothelial cell dysfunction may, be, may place the cornea at greater risk of developing endothelial decompensation with bullous keratopathy. Now this is a schematic diagram which we have all seen over the years, so pos for paucity of time I will skip. Patients with diabetic keratopathy have impairment of epithelial basement membrane, epithelial wound healing is also delayed, delayed. epithelial stromal interaction is there, endothelial function is compromised and nerve functions are also compromised. The corneal disorder associated with diabetic keratopathy are characterized histologically by subepithelial deposits, thickening of the subepithelial basement membrane and altered morphological appearances of the corneal epithelium and endothelium. 
There are not only ultra structural changes throughout the cornea but also alterations of the tear film in diabetic eyes resulting in ocular discomfort, burning and foreign body sensation. The severity of the tear film dysfunction is significantly correlated with severity of the diabetic retinopathy in which newer studies are coming and there's a greater tear film dysfunction in eyes with more proliferative changes of the retina. It was suggested that one or more of the following events may lead to the alteration of tear film and ocular surface of, of diabetic patients which is chronic hyperglycemia, corneal nerve damage and impairment of the insulin action. Patients with diabetes had less nerve fiber bundles in the cornea than the healthy control subjects possibly due to the presence of polyneuropathy. These findings may account for decreased corneal sensitivity in diabetic patients. Due to the epithelial dysfunction, patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy are increased risk of developing corneal disorders such as epithelial defects and recurrent epithelial erosions. There is increased corneal thickness has been reported in diabetic patients, however the exact cause is still not known. So there are several studies on the corneal endothelial cells in diabetic patients reported a decrease in cell density and poly with polymegathism and pleomorphism. However, the percentage of hexagonal cells in diabetic patients was not significantly different. Protecting the ocular surface is crucial in diabetic patients due for phaco surgery because diabetes affects all components of the tear film. The use of artificial tears is also important. It is necessary to carefully examine the functional disorders in diabetic patients suspected for diabetic keratopathy including disorders in the permeability of the corneal tissue. When you are doing the biometry also on that day it's very important that you do a random blood sugar because the corneal thickness is, in, increased, uh, is increased in sugar levels above 300 mg per deciliter and even on the day of the surgery it's important that you do a biometry. So even sometimes, the, uh, even especially in these COVID patients who were on steroids, the sugar, no matter how hard you may try, may not go below 250 or things like that. So whenever you are operating on a patient who has more than 200 milligram of deciliter uh, uh, sugar level, uh, that you should take a special consent form, get a special consent form signed by them. Um, uh, in uh, in American Journal of Ophthalmology, Ophthalmology, it's also reported that below 300 also you can still operate. In conclusion, chondroitin sulfate and sodium halonate must be used in all patients with uncontrolled diabetes undergoing phacoemulsification. This is one thing we should keep in mind and on the day of the surgery we must do a RBS test. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you sir. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, do we have Dr. Vanshika or Dr. John Sarkar here in this room? Yeah. As we, uh, so Dr. John Sarkar will be presenting on DSEC in difficult situations where trapped, how to come out. As we have almost reached our time limit, so we need to be really sure. Sure, ma'am, sure, sure, sure. It's coming. Can you move on the slides? A uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Without wasting much more time, I think uh, we are sh running short of time <laughs> as commanded by the ma'am. So I will be presenting the second difficult situations. When trapped, how to come out? I have no financial interest. So whenever we trapped, we have two physiological responses, either fight or fly. So today we will not fight or we will flight. So today we will sort out the issue with our best expertise and surgical knowledges. So these are the some of the eyes, those are referred to our cornea cleaning. All the patient have same clinical features. All the patient having the decompensated cornea with several degrees of visual impairment, but all the patient having the visual potential. The, all the patients sound posture statement. They have the visual potential. So, these are the special case scenario whether this can be done or not. Yeah. So I'm just sharing the some of the video presentation. Sound please. These are the this is the AVK elderly lady, extremely photophobia came to our hospital from the Bihar. So I'm planning for the DSEC. So while I'm approaching, this is a thick retroconnal membrane was there. Sound is not coming. Yeah. So I was trying to remove the retroconnal membrane by cutting in a piecemeal fashion, but inadvertently I noticed there is an aerodialysis surgery. On table, I have decided to go stay suture to carry on the surgery. 
control enter which to be done a irish cross the was implanting followed by this part and this book first forward inserting the disc in a taco fashion while maintaining the enter chamber with the irrigating cannula unfolding these things switch it in the main wound sound please total unfolding through the main wound because when we was trying to ideally should be side foot but there is tilting of the irish claw lens so as it formed with the whole thing and surgery was completed so this is my immediate post op as there is the hydrolysis the blood loss is there the fibrin was done i have started the oral steroid and this is a six weeks post op the lady having the 6 by 24 vision n12 and other i we have done the feco so now she is a very happy patient this is the another one the dissect in a small with a small graft in advantageously the actual graft size was small because my new assistant while opening two things he has unsterile so i have the only option was 7.5 mm which supposed to be 8 or 8.5 mm now see the what i am facing the difficulties to settling the graft i thought i have done i thought i have done see what is the problem then what on table i decided to put a model sir air bubble behind the graft and using it as a roller coaster drag it to the centrally and complete the surgery so post of 6 by 9 which maintained the last 2 to 3 years and the moving to the last one that is feco with the sc able sound please here the primary surgeon put a sc able long back and there is a no vitectomy was done so i have done the first inferior pi do the vitectomy behind the is very easy but man proposed god disposes so while i removing the sc able i thought i will just remove it of sc able and put a irish claw but the haptic is stuck on the there i am not able to pull it off if i try to inadvertently there may hydrolysis so i was planning i will plan to cut the optic haptic junction remove the sal optic part do the control enter vitectomy now try to be pull it but it is knocked over there then almost at the level of the angle i cut the trim it and this part is removed then do the enter again enter vitectomy irish claw is plain placing disc was inserted routine fashion taco and i was very happy that i complete the surgery put the air bubble and it was very nice looks po immediate post up but the next morning when i saw graft was there but no ar is there i was anticipating maybe the graft will dislocated so uh, i called the patient next morning again and you can see invariably graft dislocated and this is the asocd picture so again again i took the patient in the ot give the ear and i thought this time it will remain and this time more disgusting it is more dislocated so what the next so i discussed with the case with my seniors those were bulk dissect surgeon and i was going through this literature then what i on table decided third time i enter whole globe i fail with the bss and then put the ear and the c3 apex and ask the patient strictly stand still like the like statue for the next 2 hours in the ot immediate post op period and i have stayed with that even patient wants to evacuate the bladder we ask the brother to help her 
help him and you can see the next morning the graph took absolutely okay so this is one of the good take home message for this type of eye where you are doing the dissect in a sf post sfl or irish claw eye ear range is very important so these are the smart answer of all this question with the first slide you can see the all the decompensated eye and this is the smart answer of all these cases thank you very much thanks for patient hearing thank you dr sarkar i will really thanks to my mentor uh, our chair of the kaunia shankar netala dr pp madam for giving me the hands on training for the dissect and of course our team dr geeta dr vaska dr swat sl thank you very much for fashion sharing these were some real nice video and real tough situation congratulations on <laughs> thank that thank you ma'am thank you so we have any comments yeah we are, we are short of time we'll just conclude the session thank you so much thank you very thank much you. so with this we have come to this session corner session for the grand talks i thank everyone here those who gave talk those who listened to us thank you so much thank you very much